you, Dean Blank. Today, as we reflect on the unspeakable losses that our country suffered one year ago, and as we remember the 18 precious lives of our own alumni struck down on that day, we find ourselves bereft of speech. All words undone, as the poet Grace Shulman has written in a special issue of the Michigan Quarterly Review. And yet, because the University of Michigan is a great center of learning, we also find that in spite of everything we must speak, we must reconstitute those undone words if we are to give voice to our nation's unanswered questions. That is why, on this terrible anniversary, we are drawn here to the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy to ponder the impact of September the 11th on our national and international society. Today, there are other places in which we will express our grief. There are other places in which we will seek a measure of consolation and support and comfort among our friends in our houses of worship, in vigil, on campus, in our homes and neighborhoods. We have also chosen to observe this date by holding an academic symposium to consider the meaning of what has happened. It takes courage on any given day to open ourselves fully to discussion and debate, to question received opinion. In the 12th century of the Common Era, the Iranian Muslim thinker Al-Ghazali Ghazali, recalled that in his youth, I poked into every dark recess and made an assault on every problem. I plunged into every abyss. I scrutinized the creed of every sect and I fathomed the mysteries of each doctrine. So it was in other traditions with Abelard, Spinoza, and Pascal. And so it is today with every scientist, scholar, or artist who has been emboldened to seek a universal deliverance from error. That undaunted boldness is unmistakably a hallmark of the University of Michigan. As members of a community embracing most of the world's major cultural perspectives and religious traditions, we probe dark recesses in all disciplines and unflinchingly we plunge into unexplored abysses. The spirit of free inquiry is the glory of a great university. And in an increasingly challenging world, we accept our responsibility to uphold and safeguard this, un this protected arena for unfettered questions and ongoing debate. It is especially appropriate, then, that we have gathered today as the first beneficiaries of the Joshua Rosenthal Education Fund, established by Mr. Rosenthal's family and friends, to strengthen the Ford School's public policies, important work in advancing understanding of international issues, to help us wrestle with the unique issues surrounding the events of September the 11th, 2001, we look forward to hearing from our distinguished panel, Dr. Brent Scowcroft, President of the Forum for International Policy, whose reflections on the Middle East have been much in the news lately. Dr. David Featherman, Director of the Institute for Social Research, who will discuss public responses to recent policy developments. And Dr. Marina Whitman, Professor of Public Policy and Business Administration, who will speak on changes in international finance. I want to express our gratitude to the family and friends of our alumnus, Josh Rosenthal, for choosing to honor his memory in this way. It was here at Michigan, in a climate of intense discussion and debate, that Josh Rosenthal cultivated his interest in public policy, an interest that is deeply embedded in his family's heritage and memorialized also in the Daniel Rosenthal Legislative Intern Awards at James Madison College of Michigan State University. Josh's public policy involvement led to his master's in public administration at the Woodrow School in Princeton University and eventually to his career in international finance in the World Trade Center where he was working on the day of his death. To tell you more about her son and the purpose of the Joshua Rosenthal Education Fund, let me introduce Marilyn Rosenthal, professor of socio sociology in the Department of Behavioral Sciences at the University of Michigan, Dearborn, director of the program in health policy studies on that campus, and associate director of the University of Michigan Medical School's program in society and medicine. Dr. Rosenthal is a medical sociologist who has written extensively on the self-regulation of physicians, medical mistakes, and comparative health systems of the United States, Great Britain, and Sweden. 
She earned her PhD from the University of Michigan as a non-traditional student returning after her children were in school. Her honors include a Danforth Fellowship for Returning Women, a University of Michigan Hopwood Writing Award, a Swedish Visiting Scholar Award, a University of Michigan Faculty Recognition Award, a Distinguished Faculty Research Award, a Distinguished Faculty Award from the Michigan Association of Governing Bodies of State Universities, and a Baxter Distinguished Submission Award for her 1995 study, The Incompetent Doctor Behind Closed Doors. Dr. Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you, President Coleman, and welcome to the university. I know that the faculty is glad to have you here, and at the same time, they will do everything they can to complicate your life. <laughs> Thank you to Becky Blank, Dean Blank of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and all her staff for the thoughtful and gracious way they have made this event possible. Thanks to General Scowcroft. Professors Featherman and Whitman for their participation. My family and I have the deepest gratitude to those of you who've supported the Josh Rosenthal Educational Fund. And I thank all of you for being here today to help us think about Josh and think about our country. One year ago, on September 11, 2001, at 9.06 a.m., the life of my family and the life of my country, of our country, came together in a profound act of political violence. Our much-loved Josh Rosenthal died in a war for which he had not knowingly volunteered and for a cause that had not been articulated. We may say the same for all of those who died on September 11th and perhaps many Americans feel this way. I, I don't believe in preordained destiny, but I do believe that history plays out in the intersection between the individual and society. And Joshua's life story is a remarkably American one. It reflects the dreams and the aspirations of immigrants drawn to our shores for generations. And it reflects the individual opportunities that America sometimes provides. Tragically, his life story ends in another intersection between where he worked and where some others uh, uh, see and, and how some others see America's international role. Joshua's maternal grandfather came to this country in 1902, a penniless 12-year-old. In the hundred years since, his family has achieved educational, cultural, and material success. Joshua's life reflects that, as did the lives of many who died in those towers. In his 44 years, Josh used his considerable grace, intelligence, whimsy, warmth, intellectual curiosity, and energy to useful purpose. Well-educated, unafraid of risk, he thought deeply about his world, and he thought deeply about his personal relationships. This is a marvelous mixture that endeared him to many, many people. He found an unexpected professional path in the world of finance, although he always retained an interest in public policy. His career took him through an envi enviable array of economic and cultural word worlds, ending up four years ago at Fiduciary Trust International, a well-respected global investment firm. The view from Joshi's office on the 94th floor of the World Trade Center South Tower was stunning. All of New York City, the financial capital of the world, and that, of course, was the view of his company, and that is our American global enterprise. Other mother's sons from countries who share the planet and share the century had a different view. 
For them, the towers symbolize America's overwhelming global domination, both economic and cultural and militarily, particularly in the Middle East. For them, the towers symbolize the dark side of American society and culture. They were fanatics consumed by rage beyond reason. Josh had a lot of unfinished business in his life, natural for a 44-year-old. And our country has a lot of unfinished business, shaping its role in the world, shaping the fight against terrorism, and shaping a strategy to achieve a more equitable world. We are proud to link Joshua's name to this program at the University of Michigan Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Our hope is that the lectures and the other activities in Joshi's name will contribute in some small way to thinking about our country's global responsibilities. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you, Marilyn, for that portrait of Josh, and thank you and all of the friends of Josh Rosenthal who are here today for choosing to memorialize his life in a way that will be meaningful to future generations of students. I would like to, at this point, introduce our three speakers, and I think I'm going to introduce them all at the same time, and um, then move from there and let, you know, in, into the, um, the substance of our, our talk today. Um, I am particularly pleased with our keynote speaker, who um, is General Brent Scowcroft. It is a great pleasure to welcome him back to the University of Michigan. He was last year on campus in 2000 when we were named the Gerald R. Ford School, when he um, came and participated in a variety of events. Um, a number of students came up to me afterwards and said, you've really got to get this guy back. And he was therefore one of the first people we thought of when we were thinking of bringing someone back here for the Rosenthal Memorial Lecture. General Scowcroft is an internationally recognized authority on foreign and military policy issues. He served as national security advisor to Presidents Ford and the first President Bush, and he's been a member of several important commissions and committees that have addressed various aspects of foreign and military policy. He's a very visible spokesperson on international issues. Um, those of you who read the papers know that he's willing to speak his mind and to ask hard questions. His most recent honor is the Peck Presidential Award given by the National Portrait Gallery of the Smithsonian Institute, honoring his individual achievements um, related to the American presidency. We are very deeply honored to have General Scowcroft with us for this occasion. Following General Scowcroft, Professor Marina Whitman um, teaches at the Ford School as well as at the Business School. Professor Whitman has spent much of her career as a practitioner working on policy and public affairs at General Motors, though she also spent a substantial amount of her career in the White House at various planes, um, working on the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and she has a substantial academic background. She's someone who really spans all of those worlds. This gives her unique insights into how the globalization of commerce has affected both countries and corporations. Given Josh Rosenthal's involvement in the world of international finance, it seems only appropriate to ask her, one of Michigan's primary international finance scholars, to talk about how that world has changed over the past year. David Featherman is director of the Institute for Social Research here at the university. Trained as a social psychologist, David has long been interested in questions of how people's ideas and attitudes develop and change, and how those ideas in turn affect their behavior. Under his direction, ISR has undertaken several studies that have explored the changes in people's attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors since last September of 11th, and he will be talking about some of those studies and their results. General Scowcroft, we're very pleased to welcome you back to campus. President Coleman, Marilyn Rosenthal, Dean Blank, ladies and gentlemen, 
Is this on? It doesn't sound like it to me, but I'll uh, try to do without it if it isn't. Thank you for those generous remarks. It's a great honor for me to be here with you today and to inaugurate the Josh Rosenthal Lecture Series on this special and tragic day. Uh, I just attended a brunch in which Mrs. Rosenthal gave a touching, you can't call it a eulogy, but very touching. And it, it reminded me again, as you all do here, gracing the hall on this particular day, of both the tragedy that we remember today, and I hope that this lecture series will remind us over and over again, not just of the tragedy, but of the obligation we have to ourselves and to the world. We're going to discuss today the world since 9-11. And I will focus on the changes in that world in foreign policy and military policy. Now, you have to recognize that attitudes certainly infuse policy. But I'm going to leave it to David to talk about the attitudes, and I will focus on the policy part. In order to talk about how things change, have changed since 9-11, I think it's important to glance at what they were before. And so I want just to remind you of a few things. The decade of foreign policy before 9-11 I think can be characterized as one of significant drift. We had just been relieved of the awesome pressures of the Cold War, and that relief sort of expressed ourselves in turning away from responsibility uh, and to treat foreign policy more like a charity uh, to which we could give or not give how and when we wanted it. So we made no deep inquisition into what might be going on in the post-Cold War world, and we did not confront really the implications for us of being the only superpower in the world. And that decade, I think we can characterize significantly by Frank Fukuyama's book, The End of History, in which he said, democracy and market economies are sweeping the world, they're triumphant, and in essence, our problems, that is the problem of aggression, war, and so on, uh, are at a pass, at an end. On particular issues, uh, with the Russians, we had gone from the notion that Yeltsin could do no wrong to Yeltsin didn't matter, and neither did the Russians, except when we needed something from them. With China, there was an air of pretty good feeling, but little substance to it. In Europe, there was a gradual estrangement between us and our closest allies, as they became more intent on integration and looked inward we reacted by becoming contemptuous and unilateral. Terrorism was a problem. We recognized it, but considered it fundamentally an issue of regionalism or special issues. And protected by our two great oceans, didn't really absorb what we now know about it. Then there were, of course, the what I would call persistence issues, the Korean Peninsula, Taiwan, India, Pakistan, 
and the Middle East, uh, where efforts were made, and I'll talk about that in a moment, <coughs> well, with uh, mixed success. In the military field, it was a period of exploration of a new world. The military likes to call it the revolution in military affairs. And it really focused on advances in information technology and in weapon accuracy. And the field that could unfold when the commander knew everything that was going on with his own forces, with the enemy forces, thus reducing or eliminating the fog of war, which was probably the main ingredient in success or failure, and also the ability to hit what you're shooting at, which overwhelmed the problem of supply in war. So that, that, was, that was going on, but mostly academically. And the real focus militarily was on what was called the bottom-up review process, and that is faced with what we thought was a notional world where we might have to fight two military contingencies at once, putatively in Iraq and in North Korea, what would be required. But all this took place in a environment of military uh, cuts. In intelligence, there were big cutbacks in personnel, and embassies, uh, uh, stations and embassies were closed in many parts uh, of the world, notwithstanding the kind of unknown ferment that was going on in those areas. And the focus was really on a new round of uh, satellites, which gave us all kinds of new capabilities to look down uh, on the Earth. Uh, then came the Bush administration. They came in, this is my interpretation, not theirs, uh, with, not with a strategic concept, but with some strategic tendencies, some, some general uh, notions. And those were several, as I would state. There were three principal problem states the Russians, the Chinese, and the North, uh, and the North Koreans. Uh, there was a, another, but of a different character, and I mention it only because of the subsequent history, and that is Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan had suffered, uh, a couple of years earlier, another military coup uh, with a dictator who uh, showed no signs of returning to democracy and so while we were currying favor with the Indians, or this was the idea of the new Bush administration, we were shunning uh, the Pakistanis. There was a reluctance to engage in peacekeeping or nation building that our military, the notion that our military was designed to fight and to kill people and not to build nations. Uh, and therefore, that should be done by somebody or some other kinds of forces. There was a tendency toward unilateralism, and this is where the notion of the single great power did have some effect. That since we had responsibilities in the world that nobody else had, we should no longer be bound or constrained by others, uh, but free to carry out uh, our own interests, which after all in our eyes were the interests of, of the world as a whole. And then the last, there was a sense that if Bill Clinton did it, it had to be wrong. Uh, that, and that, that's not unique to this administration. That happens to every new administration. Uh, in military affairs, there was a huge push for ballistic missile defense. Uh, there was also a push toward making concrete the revolution in military affairs by looking at the procurement budget, taking out some things which were indicative of a of warfare of the past, tanks, 
fighter aircraft, battleships, sea control, and so on, and focusing on the new technology, but it was more, it was more generality than it was uh, specific. There was also the new notion of power projection, that one of the ways we would project, protect the United States is to have forces that would fight out there. We would push conflict away from uh, the United States. Uh, and there was also a push for a, uh, for a bigger budget. General, but hopefully focused, hopefully the administration thought, on the revolution in military uh, affairs. Then came 9-11. The initial at reaction to the awful tragedy uh, was a great coming together in the world. NATO invoked Article 5 for the first time in NATO's history. <coughs> Jacques Chirac, uh, sort of the bete noir of the alliance, said, we are all Americans. Uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the Pakistanis, which is particularly important, of course. Iran, Sudan, Yemen, all, a lot of Syria, a lot of unlikely people reacted by coming together uh, against this uh, atrocity. The president declared the war on terrorism our number one priority. And seemed in his rhetoric to make it his, the mission of his presidency. The focus was, uh, was on terrorism with a global reach. That is the focus directly on Al-Qaeda as a global, not simply a product of regional tensions, whether they be in uh, Ireland, Colombia, or other places but terrorism that is worldwide. Some of the early strategic tendencies that I have mentioned were modified and uh, Russia changed dramatically in our eyes. This had started before 9-11, but it was emphasized after 9-11. After all, Russia had suffered badly in Afghanistan, had problems along its southern border, had great experience with, uh, with Afghanistan, and offered their support. China, as well, began intelligence cooperation with the United States. And of course, China had its own problem of terrorism on its western <coughs> frontier. Most remarkable was Pakistan. President Musharraf, despite what you have to say was less than warm treatment by the United States, cast his lot thoroughly with the West at some great risk to himself. And thus, in effect, made possible the military operation uh, in Afghanistan. Nation building, we have, are reluctantly coming around to the notion that wars don't solve the problems, they just decide who's going to solve the problems. And especially in Afghanistan, it's not going to go away. And one of the problems we had after the Russians left was that we were not sufficiently devoted to the issue to try to build something there, and thus we laid the ground for uh, a Taliban regime. Uh, unilateralism is uh, still an open issue. The president responded warmly after 9-11 and said, uh, we want coalition, we want to go together, we want to, uh, to do this as a world community. Uh, we adopted the 
notion of floating coalition, uh, which is, as Secretary Rumsfeld said, the mission defines the coalition, uh, which is a, a step in the right direction. But we did not reach out to those who offered military support in the initial phases of the Afghan conflict uh, and said, no, we, we can do it ourselves. We don't need, uh, we don't need help, which was, I think, a, a, uh, a mistake. Uh, allies, especially given that we didn't have great, we didn't have significant forces on the ground. Allies are a pain in the neck. You have to take care of them. Almost no country other than the United States is able to sustain its troops at any distance from its homeland. So we have to take care of everybody else. So it is a pain in the neck. But it is also a problem for us to say, no, we don't want your battalion. We can do it without it. And so we're still, we still have some problems here. Uh, ballistic mi in military affairs, ballistic missile defense is almost, has disappeared from public consciousness. It's still going on, the build up. But, uh, but it is never mentioned with respect to Iraq now, despite the fact that uh, ballistic missile defense was uh, supposedly designed for the rogue states. So there, but overall, there has been a significant change in attitude, in the attitudes with which the Bush administration came, uh, came to power. The military response was swift and brilliant. Uh, we utilized technology. We tested these ideas about information technology uh, together with unarmed aerial vehicles. Why we call them that, I don't know. But anyway, we used to call them drones, but now it's much more exciting. Uh, <laughs> it had been neglected by the military uh, because the Air Force can't imagine anything flying without a pilot in it. Uh, I'm an Air Force officer, so I can, I, I can say that. Uh, but anyway, we, the technology was phenomenal. It used to be that you would have little spotter airplanes out and so on, and they would see something, and they would call back in to uh, a headquarters who would then call the B-52 uh, squadron, and they would come out, and they would have coordinates, and they would drop their bombs. Now, you have a UAV circling around, flying out there, piloted by somebody a thousand miles away, not by somebody right there, a thousand miles away, and can pipe in to the B-52s or the C-130s or whoever is up there on alert, the pictures that the UAV sees. So the bomb droppers see exactly what the people who are picking out the targets see. It's an incredible system and, and operated almost, well, it operated virtually flawlessly. The flaws were when what we saw wasn't what we thought we saw. Uh, but anyway, it was, it was terrific. Uh, we were probably better against the Taliban than Al Qaeda because I think we we really didn't fully appreciate this was a different kind of war, and what we had was Al Qaeda what we were going after, but Al Qaeda was being protected by the Afghan government, which we call the Taliban. Uh, and so we really focused on the Taliban, and but they, you know, they quit when it was clear that they were being defeated, like Afghans do. They change sides and and uh, uh, went away. Al Qaeda did not. We didn't realize that until until later, and we let a lot of them slip through through bribes and all all other kinds of things. That was a process of learning 
what war on terrorism really, mean, really means. But that, I think, on the whole, was a successful phase. It's winding down now. We're still going after some, so on. But it is winding down. But that phase, that is a military phase, is probably over. I think there will not be probably any other nations who will want to be the next Taliban. And that's going to change the character of the war. It's going to change it to be fundamentally a war of intelligence with some military operations, probably very small, in the areas where Al-Qaeda is likely to flee to from Afghanistan or still has strength, either in weak countries with a weak government, like, for example, Indonesia, Yemen, or a non-existent government, like Somalia, where, in fact, you may have to send uh, forces in. But I think there, there isn't going to be another Afghanistan in the war on terrorism. Uh, now, one of the things that means, it, this revolution of military affairs and this high-tech weaponry, which we displayed so brilliantly uh, in Afghanistan, is virtually useless. We don't need it, and we can't use it to go after the shadowy networks that represent Al-Qaeda. Terrorism also changed the nature of intelligence, which it, this is now the nature of the war. Uh, we have always had, since the National Security Act of 1947, a big line representing the border of the United States. And the CIA operated on one side of it, and the FBI on the other side of it. And that was a pretty strict border. And it worked, it worked pretty well, despite the fact that no two organizations get along completely well. Uh, it, it worked during the Cold War, and it worked primarily because the problems were all outside that border, other than a few counterintelligence problems where there were difficulties. Unfortunately, in the war on terrorism, there are no borders. The terrorists don't care. The border means absolutely nothing. So we have problems which you've seen in congressional complaints, congressional investigations. Were we ready for 9-11? Did we miss something? Was there an intelligence failure? Well, the problem is you've got these two organizations, and you have to hand off from one to the other when you come to the border of the United States. Now, that's not an easy problem bureaucratically, but it's a worse problem culturally because the CIA and the FBI have different cultures. And they come at, prob at the problem from opposite ends. The law enforcement culture, the FBI, starts with an issue, starts with a problem. You focus on something you know about, a crime's been committed or something, and you build your evidence. You're looking for particular things that will support your case and you protect your evidence that you gather so it will be pure to present to a jury. The intelligence analyst does exactly the opposite. He looks at a chaotic bunch of things happening out here and he says, is there a pattern that I can find in all these seemingly disparate events that I can put together and see something before it happens and prevent it. And that's the real problem we have with messing our intelligence. Uh, it's not stubbornness. It's not resistance. It's a very different cast of mind. And the question we need to ask is, do we really want to change our law enforcement officers, our FBI, 
into intelligence analysts. Uh, and you don't do it, incidentally, just by putting a different label around his neck and saying, you're now an analyst, you're no longer a law enforcement officer. That's one of the things that we are, uh, that we're grappling with uh, right now. The terrorist networks, uh, as I say, are very shadowy, indistinct. The cells are very loosely tied together. Some of them are, for all practical purposes, autonomous. But what Al-Qaeda, and the name means the base, what Al-Qaeda has done is take these discontent, malcontents, whatever you want to call them, uh, and give them training so that they know how to build bombs, so that they know how to evade customs, so that they know how to falsify documents. It turns them from run-of-the-mill, scruffy uh, malcontents who might throw a stick of dynamite somewhere into skilled operatives who know how to do things more skillfully. We cannot win this war by ourselves. We cannot do it. We need help. We need the help of every intelligence service who is willing to work with it. And we hope all of them are willing to work with us in this case. Uh, just take money laundering, for example. And I hope I'm not cutting into your marina. Uh, what, can, what can we by ourselves do about money laundering? Insignificant. Not insignificant, but can't begin to attack the problem of terrorism that way. So we need help from everybody. That's the first thing we have to do. We have to reach out, not because we believe instinctively or don't in multilateralism as a concept. We need it in our own self-interest to be able to effectively prosecute this war. Now the conceptual nature of the intelligence problem is, is fairly simple. Every time the terrorists talk, every time they move, every time they spend money, every time they receive money, there are traces. All of these involve some activity. Uh, the task is, first of all, to pick out that activity and to pick it out when there are millions of other similar activities and transactions going on by innocent people. And there are a couple of problems there. First of all, how do you sort it out? And how do you, especially when they're talking a variety of strange languages, how do you know what you're getting when you get it? Uh, and secondly, how do you sort out the ones you want from the others without invading the privacy unacceptably of all the innocent people doing these transactions? Uh, that is a problem we're still working on. I think it is probably not impossible to do it by using technology rather than people to do uh, the, the sorting. We, we, uh, the Congress passed shortly after 9-11, the Patriot Act, to help us deal with these issues of privacy and, and the intersection between uh, the FBI and the CIA. But I'll be honest, the Privacy Act was more, it was done in a hurry, and I think most of the lawyers in the Justice Department reached in their desk drawers and pulled out all the stuff that they had they would like to get through the Congress and through it in the Patriot Act. It was not focused on the problem that we have in the war on terrorism. Homeland Security. Isn't it interesting that we've gone 200 years and have not needed a department or whatever you want to call it of Homeland Security. That is an indication of the new world that we're in. We have never needed a Department of Homeland Security. Never needed it because we were secure behind our two uh, 
uh, or oceans, or we had the technology that could keep conflict uh, uh, from us. Uh, we do need it now. We need it. It has three missions, really. The threat, what are, what are the terrorists trying to do to us? The vulnerability, where are we vulnerable and what can we do to reduce that vulnerability? And lastly, what do you deal if, what, uh, what do you do if there is an event? How do you respond efficiently and effectively? Uh, there were brilliant acts of heroism on 9-11 but the fact is that the police department and the fire department couldn't communicate on their radios with each other. So it's that sort of thing. Uh, one of the things we don't know is how Homeland Security will relate to this new military command being set up, the Northern Command. But the import, one of the important things to remember is that however useful Homeland Security will be, in reducing the opportunities for terrorists to wreak damage as they have, it is not a solution to the problem. You cannot win the problem on terrorism on the defensive by cleaning up afterwards or be trying. We are so open. There are so many points of vulnerability in our systems, which most, most of which have been built without a thought to this kind of problem that we can't possibly cover them all. So Homeland Security can mitigate the effects. It cannot solve the problem. We can solve it only on the offensive. Can we win it? Yes. What does that mean? It doesn't mean winning it like a peace treaty on the battlefield of Missouri. It means reducing it to the kind of situation we have with organized crime. It's still around, but it doesn't prevent the average citizen from living with a sense of security. But we can do that. We can do that by breaking up the networks and destroying what we can find and at least reducing the skill levels of the others. Where are we now? This will be a long struggle. It's very hard. We don't really know how to do it well. We've never done this before. Our great military machine is largely useless in this kind of a conflict. Uh, and the questions are, will the national mood hold? I'm encouraged one year later to see the outpouring around the country. Hopefully, we can sustain that for as long as it takes, which is, has to be reckoned in a matter of years, not months. Another problem we face is that international cooperation is waning. Our focus on Things like the Axis evil and Iraq have led others to ask, you know, what our goal really is, because they don't see the connection that uh, we point out uh, in these uh, different kinds of conflicts. Our relationship with Europe continues to deteriorate, not dramatically, but fairly steadily. With Russia, we still have a good relationship, but it is fragile. And when we do things like sending troops into, uh, sending training troops into Georgia to help them fight terrorists on their border, uh, it gives the Russians pain, to say the least. And we're also deep in Central Asia right now with temporary military bases, but that also gives the Russian problems. Uh, the persistent issues, well, I mentioned China before. Uh, we're okay with China. 
we've gotten we're still getting intelligence cooperation with them and they're supportive uh, what they will do in the UN is, is another problem uh, the persistent issues there have been ups and downs Korea India Pakistan the administration did a brilliant job that is probably the worst potential crisis in the world today it is still a crisis but there's been a calming effect thanks to uh, our intervention Taiwan Middle East where we have blown hot and cold well that's what's happened over the year let me end with a cautionary note we cannot just deal, as I have this afternoon, with the terrorists and the consequences of their acts. We must also go after the roots of terrorism. And that is a long-term problem and not just one of poverty. It is much more complex, but it demands our attention as well. Thank you very much. The general is not an easy act to follow, um, as clearly the people who are departing know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> before I focus on the subject that I've been asked to talk about today, sort of what's happened in the international economy, I'd like to mention one thing, and that is I started today by attending a singing of the Mozart Requiem in one of our local churches by a group, community group. And this was a very moving event. But what is particularly significant about it is that it's part of what was, has been called the Rolling Requiem. That is, all through this long and difficult day, all around the world, in some time zone, at exactly 8.46 in the, moment, in the morning, the moment that the first plane hit the World Trade Center, some group will begin to sing Mozart's Requiem. It started in American Samoa when we were all still asleep, and it will end just west of there, I guess, uh, when, uh, <clears throat> when we're going to bed 24 hours later. And I thought that this was a, a bright note in this difficult day, that groups literally all around the world have come together to remember the people who died that day in this way. Now, to say a little bit about the economic side of what's happened both in the US and, the, and in the world since last September 11th. The two big economic questions after that day, of course, were one, would the US economy collapse? And two, would the movement toward the integration of the global economy survive the shock? And those two questions were actually very closely interrelated because at that time, virtually the whole world was in either slowdown or recession. And it was pretty well agreed that the United States was the only available locomotive to pull the world economy out of that slump? Well, the answer a year later is, I believe, no to the first question. That is, the United States economy did not collapse. And yes to the second question. The progressive integration of the world economy did survive the shock. Actually, at the time that the World Trade Towers fell, the US economy was already in what some people say is a slowdown and some people is a say is a recession. 
And of course, it was momentarily stopped dead in its tracks by what happened. As you know, no planes flew, people didn't go anywhere, and things kind of ground to a halt. And some industries were particularly devastated, um, airlines, tourism, hotels, and so forth. And those particular industries have not yet recovered, either here or elsewhere in the world. But um, the, on an overall scale, that drop was very short-lived. Our econom overall economic activity declined only in that one quarter of last year. Since then, growth in our country has picked up, um, though slowly, and although it's not at the rate we'd like to see, most people feel that a double-dip recession is unlikely, although never impossible, of course. There have been, of course, some significant economic uh, downsides. Costs have increased for producing and distributing goods, security costs, insurance costs, the difficulties of logistics. Uh, President Bush and Prime Minister Chrétien met here the day before yesterday to talk about speeding up the progress of trucks across the Ambassador Bridge, which is very important to uh, the economies of Michigan and Ontario in, in particular. We've returned rather faster than anybody thought possible to government deficits, and while in the very short run the government deficit probably helped keep our economy afloat, for the longer run, it's a complication that we hadn't expected to have to contend with for quite a long time to come. And it certainly turned on a dime. Well, it was more than a dime, but it certainly turned quickly. Um, and, of course, there was the stock market collapse. But I have to say that the stock market collapse was apparently much more due to the harm that we did to ourselves through scandals like Enron and all the ones that followed than to the harm that other people did to us through uh, the events of 9-11. So our economy, while, you know, people still suck their thumbs about uh, how well it's doing, seems to have come, seems to have been remarkably resilient. Now, in the global dimension, again, in all aspects but one, this sort of pulling together rather than pulling apart of the global economy in the economic sense, and I'm not talking about the issues that General Scowcroft was addressing. Um, it's been, I think, doing okay. World trade, of course, dropped a little bit, uh, again, right in the aftermath of 9-11 and in the aftermath of that kind of world slump. But it's picked up substantially and is actually expected to grow quite quickly, maybe as much as 10% next year. Uh, against a good many odds, the members of the World Trade Organization managed to agree on an agenda for the next round of world trade liberalization called the Doha Round. And the significant things about that is, first of all, there was a lot of concern after, about, uh, after the debacle in Seattle whether it would happen. And secondly, it's been dubbed the development round. Now, we still have to deliver on the promise implicit in that title, but at least it was a good place to start. And more and more countries, countries like China, like Russia, have been scrambling to join the World Trade Organization. And President Bush got what's colloquially called fast track, the authority essentially for American negotiators in, in trade negotiations to negotiate effectively, um, although he got it by a squeaker, three votes, and he had to give away enough in the way of added protection for the steel industry and for American agriculture that there's still some controversy over the game was worth the candle, and that still remains to be seen. American investment in so-called emerging markets, uh, building plants and starting um, businesses, is holding up, and surveys, in fact, indicate that most multinational companies expect their foreign operations to expand in the next few years, and actually, a larger proportion of companies have said that after 9-11 than before. And even the so-called anti-globalization protesters are really protesting more 
about how globalization is taking place than about the fact that it is occurring. Financial markets, which were <coughs> Josh Rosenthal's particular focus, recovered extremely fast after 9-11, though Latin America is still having some significant problems. There's been some real contagion from the, contagion from the Argentine debacle uh, into other Latin American countries like Brazil and Uruguay, but the International Monetary Fund has stepped in to prevent disaster. Uh, this administration in the United States has changed its position on that and has um, supported that, that intervention by the International Monetary Fund. And the basket cases of a few years ago, the countries in Southeast Asia are in fact doing quite well. As far as foreign aid goes, President Bush has committed us to a 50% increase in our foreign aid, which is nothing to be brag about because we have one of the lowest proportions of foreign aid in proportion to our gross national product of any developed country. And finally, after a lot of squabbling, the issue of providing drugs affordably to poor countries for their catastrophic diseases is finally beginning to move. The one area where the integration, integration has taken a step backward, I would say, is in immigration. And it's not surprising, obviously, that people, that the insecurity we feel. Uh, President Fox's initiative in which he tried to institute a dialogue with the United States about the movement of people across the U.S.-Mexican border has ground to a halt. Universities like this one and many others are concerned about the impact on foreign students of tightened up uh, immigration rules. And uh, that is one area where the movement has been in a pulling apart direction. Inevitable, but I hope uh, we will be able to find a way to protect our security, which we must, and at the same time uh, maintain the flow of people and of ideas that has always been a hallmark of this country. So putting up the picture all together, I would say that in the economic and financial sphere, the world is pulling together rather than pulling apart. We have learned once again, shockingly painfully, the lesson of John Donne, the 17th century divine and poet, that no man, and by the way, no country, is an island. At home, <clears throat> we have had a renewed sense, not only of vulnerability, but of community. And David will be talking more about that and how durable it is. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, Wall Street firm, competitive Wall Street firms, which usually were ready to scratch each other's eyes out, actually helped each other and lent each other people and facilities. And there is still the sense in this country, I think, of uh, some of that. Globally, the U.S has been reminded that it is not an island of security. That as the general said, for the first time, we feel we do need a homeland defense. And furthermore, that social and economic developments in the rest of the world, and particularly in poor countries, which have not really become part of this integrated circle, do affect us. And <clears throat> Are the lessons that we've so painfully learned worth the lives that were lost? Of course not. But if we learn that lesson well, then at least some good can come from this tragedy. The 19th century satirist Ambrose Bierce once wrote that war is God's way of teaching the Americans geography. <laughs> well. In this case, through terrorism, we learned a particularly painful lesson in geography, including how to pronounce the names of some countries that we had never heard of or thought of before, but also a very tragic lesson in the dark side of globalization.
because the terrorists are just as much a part of globalization as increased trade and investment and foreign aid. But global economic developments since then, I think, have at least given us a slate on which to etch <coughs> its brighter promise, the brighter promise of globalization, if we have both the will and the wisdom to do it. Thank you. Of course, I want to begin by thanking the Rosenthal family for this uh, most inspirational and intellectual comm commemoration, and I'm really honored to be part of it. I want to address three dimensions of American life that were affected by the events of September 11th, and also by the continuing specter of imminent terrorist attacks over the past year. And I'll do that with the benefit of an ISR study, How Americans Respond, which started four days after those attacks by interviewing a representative national sample of over 700 Americans by telephone. We've been re-interviewing the same individuals and households at six-month intervals since, and we're just completing the last of those as I'm speaking. And uh, if you're interested in the, the, the charts and information that I'll be drawing from, they are available on the ISR website. And I want to recognize Mike Traugott and my colleagues, all of whom have been uh, inspirationally dedicated to this study over the last year. The first theme I want to address is the slowly healing American psyche. Throughout the nation, the events of September 11th angered and wounded us as individuals. Nearly half of us, when asked, how much has the attack shaken your personal sense of safety and security, said a great deal or a lot. And only 14% of us said not at all. When asked if we experienced what mental health researchers believe are key indicators of depressed mood and stress, perhaps even depression, many of us revealed higher levels of personal distress than ISR researchers had measured in decades. And not surprising, these symptoms of mental stress or distressed mood were more extensive in those who felt less secure or safe as a result of those attacks. These psychological impacts were also more prevalent and deep among those who paid closest attention to the news about the attacks. And of course, we remember the repetition of all those images. Children, children were affected too. And not only those living among those who suffered direct losses or who resided in the East. We asked parents and other adults living with children under 18 if a child showed signs of distress, increased nightmares, more easily annoyed or startled, had unusual trouble concentrating. Reports of children's distress tend to lie below what adults say about themselves on similar indicators, but then we know from research that children suffering trauma seem to, to uh, actually tell us they suffer more than their parents are able to see and report on their behalf. Six months later, now I'm talking about February or March of this year, our sense of pay, uh, personal safety and security had improved, but barely so. There were anthrax attacks, real and imagined, the closing of post offices and of government buildings in DC, official warnings and alerts of various colors were pervasive. On measures of mental distress or depressed mood, there were some early signs of resilience then, and the economy, including our confidence as consumers in the economy's future, seem to be slowly on the rebound. But whatever psychological recovery we gained after six months has not accelerated much in the past six months. We've not gained that much more ground. Today, fully 40% of us say we feel less safe and secure now than before the attacks. And that compares to 47% six months ago and 49% just after the attacks. Fully one-third of us, fully one-third of Americans we interviewed now three times, still feel modestly or deeply shaken by the attacks. And 9% say they are even more shaken or insecure. Parents, 
Parents say of their children that they show some fewer signs of distress, and that's terrific, and that they need less reassurance about their safety than just after the attacks. That's good, too. And we hope these improvements continue. But why this persistent psychological burden? Recovery from trauma of the scope of 9-11, even among those not directly touched by it, is slow, as psychiatrists, child psychologists, and pediatricians report from clinical research about past disasters, quite different events like Oklahoma City or the Challenger disaster. And if you saw the New York Times this morning, there was extensive coverage of the slow recovery post-trauma. This slow recovery, this persistence is also common among adults and children exposed, of course, to repeated traumatic events, such as those who live in the Middle East. And maybe that gets exactly to the point. Americans believe a terrorist attack is imminent, even if not in their own communities. When asked last March to forecast the likelihood of an attack of bioterrorism on the US in the next five years, more than half of us gave it better than a 50-50 chance. And those who, who, who then felt uh, uh, most shaken uh, thought it even, even more likely. Most of us then, however, said that the attacks were much more likely to occur somewhere else in America. It's going to happen, but it's not going to happen where I live. Now, as an aside, this is an interesting displacement of apprehension and its source, and it challenges public health and safety officials in this new Department of Homeland Security to prepare communities of households and citizens for their mobilization and response in the event of a localized attack, if they're constantly thinking that it's going to happen somewhere else. As of today, as we're now completing the last round of our surveys, nine out of ten of us think a terrorist attack or some similar act of violence will occur somewhere in the U.S. relatively soon. Just as in this past March, today more than three quarters of us say there is a greater than 50-50 chance of a bioterrorist attack in the next five years. So therefore, in this context of impending threat, however real or imagined, the psychological burden of 9-11 weighs heavily on the American psyche of adults and of kids too. A second theme, and now in the form of a question, a new national unity? In spite of this persistent psychological burden and impending threat, there's some good news. And the good news may be related to our need to come together in our time of recovery and healing. September 11th brought us together in new ways as a nation and evoked the sympathy and empathy of the world in new ways. In surveys of all kinds, Americans expressed unabashed patriotism, pride in living in the United States, and appreciation for the values of freedom and inclusiveness that stand us apart as a unique democracy. And despite the connection of the attacks to terrorists mobilized out of the Near and Middle East, Americans reject an isolationist foreign policy. And importantly, even in regions of the country more heavily populated by new immigrants, Americans ex express positive sentiments like these. Immigrants make the U.S. more cultured. Immigrants are good for the economy. Immigrants do not increase crime rates. Six months after the attacks in March, we, we, we re-asked a series of questions long by, used by ISR to assess both positive and negative feelings and beliefs about American ethnic and racial groups. We call them the feeling thermometer questions. Compared to national studies during the late 1980s onward, mainly from ISR's national election studies, our post 9-11 data indicate a far more positive feeling toward hyphenated Americans, if I may use that phrase. A warmer, more inclusive embrace of common fate, perhaps. The inclusiveness applies to Americans with ancestry in the Middle East, too. But for some, mainly Muslim and Arab Americans, at somewhat more modest levels. However, for those who live in the Middle East, who are resident in the Middle East, including Palestinians, Arabs, and Israelis, as contrasted to Jewish Americans, the feeling thermometer is less positive. 
So the good news is that some new national unity seems to persist, at least for now. We took a hit from political terrorists from the Middle East, but our response as patriots and citizens to now has avoided jingoism and isolationism. Having said that, I don't want to under overstate a new civic engagement or unity. It is at best partial and possibly ephemeral. For example, President and Mrs. Bush put out a call for volunteers to help America. Indeed, for many months after the attacks on New York, <clears throat> random acts of kindness and more organized volunteerism seemed part of the daily news and it buoyed us. And yet, recent social science data indicate that volunteerism across the country is not up. And whatever blip may have occurred in local communities just after 9-11 seems to have diminished, except for one group. And that is from the minority of long-term committed volunteers. And that's many people in this room, I'm sure, who increased their hours of commitment by about 38% since September. So in some ways, uh, to use uh, Robert Putnam's now well-known caricature of civic um, engagement in this country, we're still bowling alone. And there's still a gap between what we say we feel and believe in these feeling thermometer questions and what we're willing to do. That is, the kinds of hours we're willing to spend on behalf of others outside our family. But the seeds of a new national uh, unity and locally active civic engagement, seeds laid in the sorry aftermath of 9-11, may yet come to full flower. And now just a final few, a few comments about national values and their preservation during the war of terrorists and the war against terrorists. And I call this reasserting national values. Just after September 11th, Americans expressed strong but qualified endorsement of policies to stem further acts of terrorism in America. In our survey, those more shaken and less secure were more likely to support a wide range of security enhancing measures. For the rest of us, however, there was less support for things like random searches, wiretaps, and for broad scale targeting or profiling of Arab Americans. Six months later, March, those who were still shaken were the stronger supporters of these measures, but then, too, also with qualification. And what I want to emphasize is this. Americans have remained cautious in sacrificing their own and also their neighbors' personal liberties, even at the moment of our greatest tragedy and threat to both national and personal security. This trade-off of personal liberty for personal and even national security runs to the heart of American values, of who we are as a people and a nation. These trade-offs we guard so carefully speak volumes to the world watching how we live out our democracy, even under our psychological burdens and even with our fears of future terrorist attacks in America. So on this day of commemoration, I would reflect on how we are seen from abroad. And now I'm not going to be talking in closing about ISR surveys, but some taken by the Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C., over 40 countries and involving over 30,000 individuals uh, in those countries. Uh, research still ongoing. Early results. While it is regrettable in those surveys that some have said we deserved what happened to us in New York and Washington, the overwhelming view, the overwhelming view from abroad is that those attacks were not on our culture. Instead, they were about our power and how we use it in the world. To some, perhaps we use it too unilaterally, they say. To others, perhaps we use it to the disadvantage of poor nations. Some fewer say it was about our foreign policies about Arab nations. But ironically, even in those Arab nations, indications of a love-hate, hate-love relationship complicate the claim of those who would see us inevitably in a war of civilizations. So what I want to emphasize from these international data, what the voices from abroad seem to be telling us through the data is so important on this day. Namely, what we were admired for as a people and nation 
is our openness, the opportunities we afford to citizens but also to immigrants, our extraordinary technological capabilities, and our system of higher education. That's what they emphasize. However we respond as individuals in America to 9-11 or even, God forbid, another domestic tragedy, we must never lose sight of the values of this great nation that are so well captured by that statue that now stands even taller in New York Harbor. Thank you. That my last comment was that the solution to terrorism is not simply to deal with poverty, that it's more complex than that. Uh, Fifteen of the twenty, I believe, were Saudis. Now, not all Saudis are rich, but there aren't any poor ones. Uh, I think we have to look at, at a couple of things, at least, and I, this, I'm going beyond whatever expertise I have. One is education, and that is in much of the region. Poor people get education and get their children fed by sending them to madrasas, uh, many of whom preach hatred and the extreme form of militant Islam. But I think more fundamental is uh, the issue of globalization and the alienation that it has brought. Uh, we were surprised by Seattle, uh, and rightly so, because I think globalization to us, to the Europeans, the Japanese, and so on, gives the promise of greater prosperity and cooperation in an integrating world. But of the 190 nations in the world, well over half are poor, weak, and really unable to provide some of the very basics that their citizens require. For those countries and those people, globalization represents an onslaught of forces that they can't even comprehend, much less cope with. And I think for them, it looks like an assault on their family values, their cultures, their way of life, uh, and they feel alienated, they feel resentful, and many of them feel hatred. And if there's a symbol of globalization, it's the United States. And so I think we need to find a way that globalization and advancing technology can bring prosperity to all rather than alienation to most. Thank you. In closing, I'd like to thank again Marilyn Rosenthal and the friends of Josh Rosenthal um, who all made this event possible and ask you to join me one last time in thanking the speakers.